so yeah the first question um, is about the fact that farmification is a part-time farming and a part-time manufacturing scheme that you devised a few years ago uh, while you were in Shenzhen in a joystick factory and you made this scheme to help workers connect with their background as farmers because many of them came from the countryside but also to gain uh, control over their own futures and so I was wondering how does an English designer get access to a joystick factory like you did because I know you speak Chinese I know you're family is Chinese, but I suspect that it's still not enough to get full access to the factory uh, like you did where you, you went to live and sleep and eat and discuss with the worker. So how did you, how did you do that? It was definitely an opportunity. It's, um, I mean, I've always been really interested in the way that productions work and manufacturing and transport and how that changes uh, these uh, cities, these areas where all of these facilities gather. Um, but I work from this um, ethnographic approach where you, you build connections and you have conversations, um, sort of constant um, questions um, and building um, trust. And you build this trust by um, Kind of you're not empathizing you're you're really just um understanding so you you you're asking questions that they themselves have been asking um so um you know sometimes i, I think well the, the 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 problems that we're raising you know is, is nothing new and um the, the you know parties themselves they, they they know about um how much uh, dependence they have and maybe the part where you know as a um, uh, English designer is is kind of the the exact um, <laughs> maybe answer or the, the the question that they're looking for, which is that um, um, they know that well uh, most of the time is spent on um, this um, dependence of the the, the Western world. Um, the people over there, they innovate and they make or they, um, they license and these guys, they have to either uh, get around it or copy or make some extra surplus to the designs in order to, to, to uh, you know, get around the patent. So they're always on the sort of the, the, the second end of the, the, the chain. And this kind of dependence then further is exaggerated uh, by another question, which is that maybe this whole industry is being phased out as people don't use joysticks that much anymore with uh, other um, innovations. So um, these were, you know, a lot of uh, questions that, that were sort of something that was plaguing them. And then, um, you know, coming over <laughs> as sort of the, the enemy, you know, someone raised in the West, and also is a designer that is a part of that um, innovation system. Um, but then seeing it from their perspective, I think they were also curious um, about what I could tell them and um, what I could exchange um, with them. And, and, you know, not everyone is um, as open to these kinds of um, uh, relationships and, and this factory particularly, you know, they, they wanted to understand a lot more. Um, and in fact, they would um, constantly, back then, um, ask me about these things. For example, uh, there was a Guitar Hero story where they would, um, they were trying to just, you know, adding, they were just adding extra buttons onto a Guitar Hero to, in order to bypass the US patent on it. And then um, they tell me about different strategies because these patents were happening from very in different countries, and um, and they, they were sort of trying to get me you know see my perspective in the process as a designer as the very people that they um, that they um, try and um, get past the, the the maybe I I was the one that you know that they saw as the original problem and. You know, this, mm -hmm. this is the process they have to get around this. So, um, what my thinking was. 
I see. I'm, I'm also curious about how you got the idea. Um, for example, did you already know right from the start? Did, you know, I mean, did you arrive in Shenzhen knowing already, oh, I will ask them to grow strawberries? Or did the whole idea develop over time after having discussed with the employees and, and the factory manager? So how was the, the development of the project? Um, well, I, I, so I went in um, with this premise, I, I knew that, you know, we have all these assumptions about factory workers as this like huge uh, army of people, this mass. And, um, and I wanted, you know, I, I'd been having all these conversations and connections, and I really wanted to um, understand it from a, a human scale um, by, you know, and I, I felt like I had to do that and, and live that lifestyle with them, you know, sleep, uh, in their dorms and eat in their canteens and hang out with them, go on evening walks, watch soap, um, stroll through night markets, you know, um, mundane, um, you know, uh, shipment trips or um, these kind of things to really understand what, what, what it's like to, to be a factory worker, to be a factory manager, to, and um, through this, the, the, one of these strongest um, points was how food was, um, food was so important in their everyday lives, but food also um, was a point of uh, control. Um, so because it's supplied, which is, which is great, you know, you've got someone cooking for you three meals a day, but for example, they, they had this Sichuan chef, and I don't know if you know about Chinese cuisine, Sichuan means is like really hot, really spicy, really strong. And, and you know, factories are made out of migrant workers, so people come from every, every part of China. And, you know, many of them, they're not used to uh, these really strong, spicy foods. And, and a lot of girls, you know, because they're eating it day in, day out for, you know, months, years, and they, they, they really would have skin breakouts and um, as a sort of quiet, um, passive way of making a protest, they would, instead of complain about it, because you don't complain, <laughs> um, you don't bite the hand that feeds you, 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 they would just pick out all the spices and um, put it in a little mountain next to them. So at the end of the day, they'd take the bowls away, but these little mountains of chilies were still left on the, on the tables. And that to me um, left such a strong resonance because, you know, um, it was kind of um, the, the fact that, um, they, that, that, that there was this uh, slight tension happening and also, um, also the fact that they would go into night markets, you know, after having had um, dinner and the free meals, they were still strolling through night markets to buy food. So I realized that, um, you know, food is also a way of exercising choice, of um, kind of expressing your own identity, even if you're framed in this very communal uh, lifestyle where you live communally, you sleep communally, you, you eat communally, but um, even when it's free, you, you still spend extra money to, to go out and um, find maybe things that relate to you, to your own uh, background, to your own sort of... Um, um, uh, country style, um, you know, um, the word own vernacular. And then um, with the farming, um, it was kind of like uh, I, I had to be very sensitive about what was what, how to propose it um, because it's seen as um, kind of going backwards uh, from create production to farming and. Um, and also, you know, making technology, technological uh, parts to, you know, going back into you know, the oldest um, uh, forms of production. So, um, yeah, it, it couldn't be something like making cabbage or potatoes or, you know, rice, um, which was sort of a, a stable and, and sort of, um, yeah, there's a hierarchy of farming. So it had to be something that was kind of whimsical and will be seen as like, oh, this is sort of fresh and it's, it's something that 
can be uh, passed over as a, a as a pastime rather than like saying okay this is a necessity and therefore because you're not being fed enough maybe from your canteens or you know uh, supplied enough from your uh, markets so there was something really sensitive in there and in fact um in china when this project was um, um reported they linked it to um uh, the, there was uh, uh, recently afterwards there was um, a drop in steel prices from uh, a housing bubble that had happened, and um, pork had increased in value. And this is kind of one of the first times it happened so so much that, so that it became a kind of social discussion across the country. And one steel factory actually changed their manufacturing to farm pigs and um and people were you know there was social uproar because since the 80s um creating steel was seen as um, this form of um production and progress um and um you know pigs were seen as like the lowest of of animals and also you've got uh, farming which is for usually for back then for internal consumption and um, you know, when you make steel, a lot of it also is for uh, export. Um, so it created this kind of very intense uh, feeling amongst, um, you know, newspaper readers and the general population. And everyone you know, would have, um, it would sort of be on tips of fingers, at the tips of people's tongues and they'd, you know, just talk about it tatting and going, ah, oh, can you believe um, what, what times we've, we've come to? But now, you know, we look at it totally differently. For example, um, uh, in 2018, we, we had this um, uh, African swine flu, the AESF, and, and now um, epidemiologists are, um, are linking that, you know, because it was such a, a big problem for that part of Asia, it, um, it, it, they estimate maybe the story 40 to 60 percent of the pig population in China and you know pigs are a main food source and that could have squeezed people into eating um, other wild meats and um, game meats um, and therefore creating this opportunity for the COVID to spill over from <clears throat> uh, what they think is um, bats maybe via the pangolin or some other uh, game meats into, into the human population. So, um, you know, um, I, I think the people's idea about meats will definitely change and about uh, farming have changed already. But back then it was uh, kind of a really jarring um, proposal. Ha, I, I didn't realize that. Um, and finally, um... What I think is interesting about farmification is that it's a kind of critique of innovation and of the kind of um, enthusiasm we have for technology and the so-called solution that technology can bring to society. It's also revealing uh, the human beings who are impacted, for better or worse, by, by our drive to consume and to be tech savvy. So could you expand on this critical, even uh, activist uh, dimension of uh, the work farmification? Yeah, um, well, this, I, I, well, this came from a, a critical design philosophy um, where you have something, um, you produce something that's tangible, but uh, instead of a solution, it's actually a dilemma. It's actually a contradicting solution. Right, so um, you know it's very different to um, maybe what um, what what the industry is used to, and definitely maybe what the the factory was used to, which is hey, here's a new product, and we make that. Um, this isn't a traditional product in in that way. Um, farmification is actually kind of a, a moral dilemma. You know, it's it's not really a, a sort of optimization. Um, and um, yeah, I, I would say uh, farming is actually, um, in, in this sense, is uh, an artifact where um, it's, um, it's an artifact that embodies all these questions and problems and then can be passed around in, you know, uh, back then maybe um, 
uh, the, the design uh, world or the tech world or you know a, a sort of solution orientated uh, uh, world society um, and but um, inside the artifact is all these um, sort of questions and problems and you know um, thinking um, so yeah it, it's kind of um, a way of making problems emerge and in you know it's, it's kind of I, I would say it's a different kind of activism so you know you've got questions that um, uh, such as migration and what are the people leaving behind and you know is, is this way of um, production sustainable is this um, livelihood sustainable um, and you know the, the questions we have about the cycle of innovation and you know maybe now that it's changed a lot with the the the, the west innovating and the east um you know following and now you know you use your face to um you know that, that would uh, buy an uh, orange juice in any train station in a um a, you know as a way of uh, payment um it but how that's um that way of being led um, in the East is also changing. So all these relationships were sort of maybe taken for granted, um, are, are being questioned um, in, in farmification. And this kind of um, uh, relationship with uh, uh, critical, I, I call it a critical activism, where it's sort of asked what if, um, it's kind of different to um, uh, other forms of activism, which can be more linear and be like, well, we need to do this or, or you know, a, a louder kind of activism. Um, this is sort of, you know, there's a slight solution, but the solution itself is actually making all the problems emerge. And um, it's sort of, you know, raising all these problems and um, maybe um, making an awareness, but in a very different form to um, much louder or more, um, um, maybe more sensational forms of activism. But um, it, it does um, also embody a lot of um, the questions within.